Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I want to first say thank you to the heroes that are out there, to those of you who are really on the front lines every day, tirelessly, uh, with such dedication and persistence, just really going in there um, with, with such dedication. And I, I'm just in awe and inspired of the work that you do. So we want to start right there by saying thanks and our debt of gratitude to the work that you're doing every day. Um, the other thing that I want to make mention is that we are all working remotely um, to really honor the recommended guidelines. And so that means that our technology isn't necessarily as good as it is when we're in the office. So please bear with us should we have technological glitches, we hope you'll understand. A few housekeeping announcements before we get started on today's webinar. You will be in listen-only mode, which means that um, if you have a question or a comment, you'll need to put that in the chat box, and then we'll be able to take those at the end of the broadcast. Um, there are handouts that you can download. They are in the handout section where you'll be able to download a PDF version of today's PowerPoint. For those of you who are joining us and you are an administrator or a nurse, there are contact hours that have been approved. This program has been approved for one contact hour for nursing home administrators through NAB. It has also been approved for one contact hour for nurses through the Maryland Nurses Association. There have been no conflicts of interest identified. In order to receive the contact hour, you must be present and attentive for the entire program. You will also need to complete a specific contact hour evaluation for your role, which is located again in the handout section of this webinar. Hello. Hello. We may have lost uh, Susan's uh, audio. I think we may have. So I'm giving you control of the screen, Anne. All right. And if you can introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience as we um, get our information up here. And I want to echo everything that Susan said, that in appreciation of how hard and how vital all of your work is that you are all doing right now to keep your residents and elders safe during this um, outbreak we're having. It's unprecedented. So I'm Ann Ellett. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner that has specialized in dementia care for over 20 years. And I'm just passionate about all of us being advocates for elders who are living with dementia. And so I really appreciate those of you on this webinar today taking time out from everything else you're doing this week because really talking about sexuality and elders living with dementia it's a very complex topic um, sometimes it's challenging to talk about and i recognize that this is taking time away from the other important duties you're doing in this time so thank you again Today, we're gonna to be discussing what are the rights of people living with dementia to express themselves and some misperceptions we might have about people living with dementia. And I'll also be talking about some interesting case studies. And then we hope to have time for your questions at the um, end today. So this is a statement from the Alzheimer's Association about dementia and sexuality. And I think it's interesting. Um, it talks about changes that might occur, but it, it talks about really it's the spouses and the partners who must adjust their attitudes and actions. 
Um, we are the ones who have to change. Uh, we can't expect change and complete understanding and comprehension from a person who is living with dementia. So it's a challenge for all of us who, first of all, the spouses and the partners, but also those of us who are involved in care. We are the ones who must be changing our attitudes and actions. Historically, um, there hasn't been a lot of research and a lot of um, in-depth articles about dementia with people living with, um, with sexuality, with people living with dementia. But we found that back in 1995, the Hebrew home in New York, as far as we know, they were the first ones to write about sexual rights for older adults in healthcare settings. And their policy has been a guideline for nursing homes in subsequent years. So this policy has been updated and it, it does uh, specifically address Alzheimer's and dementia in relation to dementia and consent. So I want to refer to the greenhouse policy just to refresh our, our memory on that. I don't know if everyone on the call is a, a greenhouse adopter or if you're live, uh, working in other long term care settings, but I'm just going to reference the greenhouse home policy. And it is based on that Hebrew homes policy. It, it speaks about the importance of sexual expression between elders living with dementia and other elders living with dementia or with their well partners. Remembering that sexual expressions are a deep memory and memories that are associated with emotion are retained longer. So it would not be uncommon for someone living with dementia to recall their sexual experiences and emotions, both pleasant or if they weren't pleasant, fearful um, or unpleasant. So sex is very tied to emotion and it would not be uncommon for a person to recall these types of experiences. Feeling sexual, expressions, uh, sexual desires, expressing sexual desires, it can help older people remember pleasant memories. It can help them feel nurtured and safe, and it can help them, of course, feel pleasure, hopefully. But sometimes it's a challenge when you have an elder or resident expressing their sexual needs and preferences in your greenhouse home or nursing home. But intimacy and physical, physical expression as a basic human need throughout the lifespan, it doesn't necessarily go away with dementia or as myself aging, other people on the call as we mature, it's uh, nice to remember that this, these memories and expressions don't necessarily stop at a certain age. So anchoring ourselves in the core values of the greenhouse homes and the core principles of the best life approach, which is the specialized approach adopted in the greenhouse homes for supporting people living with dementia. So I'm just going to quickly touch on these, the greenhouse home, um, core values, real home, meaningful life and empowered staff. So certainly real home speaks to people being able to express themselves and having intimacy, meaningful life. These are very meaningful expressions for elders. And the uh, core principles of the of best life, the power of normal. This is a normal adult desire and expression. We believe that we want to focus on retained abilities rather than focusing on losses and inabilities. We also believe that a person living with dementia has the dignity, has, can be allowed to have the dignity of risk. We don't have to control every small aspect of their life and their schedule and um, how they express themselves. Even though when they come into a nursing home environment, that's our desire often because we wanna think of every risk possible and help minimize it and control as many things as we can. 
but really they are adults and they have the right for dignity of risk within certain guidelines. And we don't have time today to really delve into that in great depth, what we mean by dignity of risk, but basically we're looking at them as adults. And then the fourth core principle is advocacy. We all have to be advocates for somebody living with dementia. We have to advocate for their rights. So there's several issues that we're gonna to touch on today. One is what is our personal level of comfort or discomfort when we consider older adults expressing their sexual needs and preferences? We'll talk briefly about how cultural, religious, and even political beliefs are evolving and changing. I certainly know in the last 20, 30 years uh, in the general culture, there's been a lot of evolution in this. We'll touch on the rights of elders living with dementia. We'll also discuss what do you think are their rights and what do you think a policy should really um, say? The fifth issue is the involvement of the family. What, what are the family desires in relation to this? How do we consider that? And the sixth issue that we'll be touching on is the regulatory rules and expectations surrounding sexual expressions of people living with dementia. All right, so first of all, let's just all acknowledge we probably um, are uncomfortable. We really don't wanna talk about this much. Um, we we have, uh, when we think of older adults expressing their sexual needs and preferences, I call it the ick factor. Um, ageism, older, old people shouldn't really be doing this. Um, why do they need to? Uh, we don't really, we don't certainly like to visualize or think of our parents having sex or having sexual needs when they're 70, 80, 90 years old. So there's just, we have to acknowledge that we probably, all of us on this call, probably the staff that are working uh, in your nursing home, we have a little bit of this feeling when we, we start talking about this subject. So what are our own, um, our own feelings uh, about this. As I mentioned, some of the comments that I that I typically hear is, um, you know, why do they really need to do that? And I didn't really think of them as older people of being sexual. Um, I know that uh, some staff have expressed concerns if the two people who are wanting to spend time together, if they're not married, there are those feelings that it's not right, they're not married. Um, and then, I think we also wanna be sure that, um, how do we know this is what they really want? How do we know that, that one person is perhaps not manipulating or taking advantage of the other person who might be living with dementia? These are all very valid thoughts and concerns and all of that we have to think about in every single situation. So our self-awareness, um, I think when you're, you're thinking of a situation maybe that might be happening in your nursing home or your greenhouse home, uh, one, just taking a moment to pause and be aware of our own feelings, emotions, beliefs about older people having sexual expressions and needs and about people living with dementia having these feelings and emotions and beliefs and talking in a transparent way to our staff, acknowledging what, what are your thoughts about this? Um, are we imposing something unnecessarily on an elder who's living with dementia because we're, we're assuming their diagnosis really defines that person? They have dementia, they're not capable of making these decisions, they don't have the rights. So, it's very complex, but I think this type of topic uh, needs a transparent discussion with your staff about it. So uh, you have a chance to talk about these things. Because like it or not, we all do have our own personal beliefs and emotions, and they are influenced by 
where we grew up, by our family teachings and upbringings, by our religious beliefs and practices, and also by our time in history, because we know from generation to generation, um, beliefs and actions around sex have been changing dramatically. We also want to acknowledge that our personal beliefs and preferences influence our actions, influence how we react to a situation. And then wherever you are working, there are systems, most likely those systems are called policies and procedures, and they are created to sustain and support the beliefs that we have at the time. And so the, an easy example to think back on is um, as recently as the 1990s, there were policies that supported tying people in bed that was supposedly to keep them safe. Um, so that policy supported that type of action. Now, thank goodness, we can look back and say we have evolved beyond that. And hopefully our policies have also evolved beyond that. But we have to recognize what beliefs we have and how those are usually reflected in our current policies um, and systems that we have where we work. So what is the new normal? Whether we are comfortable or uncomfortable with it, we know that it is considered that what is considered normal or okay is changing. You can think back to when you were a young person, you can think back to where your parents' time or your grandparents' time, and you can see how radically things have changed. And so should we be careful to try not to judge others? Because what might be considered abnormal or incorrect or not acceptable this year 20 years from now, it might be, things might have evolved. So I think it's very careful that we're thoughtful about this subject and thoughtful about our approach and um, try to, as I mentioned, be aware of our own beliefs and biases and try not to judge when we're talking about a subject that's so complex. So here's an example of how things have changed. I live in California, but this is going on in other states also. And so the governor of California, um, a few years ago, this um, he put out a, a statement of LGBT rights and in our long-term care industry and how uh, they have the right to be able to express themselves and their preferences. So that is a topic that frankly, I don't think 20 years ago, we would have seen anything written about it or being discussed in the uh, public media or discussed as the rights within long-term care. So this is just an example of how things um, are changing. So what are your rights? If you are an older person living in a greenhouse home or a nursing home, and these come from the, the core values of your greenhouse homes. If you're in, working in other nursing homes, I would bet that you also have similar statements uh, about resident rights. And they have the right to person-centered individualized care. We have the right to express our choices, personal choices. And um, we know that we're trying very hard to meet those, uh, those rights. We're trying to give people the choice of when they wanna eat their meals and what they wanna have. We're not just serving the same thing to everybody. We're giving people choices on their preferences on when they wanna to go to sleep at night. Um, so there have, has been great improvements and evolution in this way. And the right to sexual expression is just goes along with that. You have a right to be treated with dignity, uh, to be treated as an adult and not a child. Uh, when uh, I'm, I'm in visiting nursing homes or memory care places, and I think it's, it speaks again to perhaps staff's own personal discomfort with the subject, 
I hear them kind of giggling or gossiping around about two people who were found in bed together or were, you know, found uh, nude in the room together or something like this. So I think that speaks again to our discomfort, uh, perhaps our beliefs, and uh, just taking us back and getting us centered that every adult who is living with dementia has the right to be treated with dignity. And then you have the right to express your preferences. And as that last slide from California showed, we have recognized that people who have uh, sexual preferences other than heterosexual have the right to express their preferences. That is their right. So here's a quote from a public policy statement in Canada, and it speaks to the right of privacy. And the elders in our greenhouse homes, first of all, are so fortunate because everyone has their own bedroom and their own bathroom. Uh, but I think we still want to think about, do we also allow them all the privacy that they are entitled to? And, and again, these are all complex questions. There's no easy answer to it. But this is a statement about resident rights to privacy. So again, thinking of your elders who are living with dementia and think about all the choices and all the decisions we make for them, even while trying to meet their individual needs and recognizing uh, that we want person-centered care. When you really think about the day of the person uh, living with dementia in your greenhouse home or your nursing home, do they really get all the, to make all the choices and, and have all the rights that they're entitled to? And let's, let's frame it in the way of when do the rights of elders or people living with dementia, when do they get their rights taken away? And we know that culturally, just socially, often that's as soon as they, they receive the diagnosis because of the stigma. Um, that's why many people, when they get a diagnosis of dementia, they try and hide it for as long as they can. Uh, they don't want people to know I used to work um, at an Alzheimer's disease research center here in, at the University of California, and we would have uh, people who worked in private companies come to us, not pay through insurance. They would come and pay privately. They suspected that they had early dementia. They didn't want it on their record. They didn't want people to know. Um, and they were going to try and hide it for as long as they could because there is such a stigma with the diagnosis. So often as soon as someone receives that diagnosis, sometimes very well-meaning people, family members, even health professionals, we mean well, but we step in and begin to take their rights away. So it's really finding a balance between supporting their rights and also keeping them safe. Isn't that true for everything that we um, try and provide and support them with? It's a balance. And um, so I'm asking all of us, whether we're talking about their sexual rights or their right to be able to walk out that front door when they want to, these are complex questions and I want us to always be aware of our own beliefs and biases when we talk about these, these challenging subjects. So what are our responsibilities? Um, our responsibilities include knowing the person, uh, not letting the diagnosis of dementia define their whole life. What is the relevant information from their medical history? What are their abilities and interests? And how can we support them to have a life of purpose and meaning and protect their right to have real relationships, meaningful relationships? We want to advocate for their rights. And we also, do, of course, do want to protect their safety. 
So does it matter what the family wants? And I imagine many of you on the phone call today have had the um, often challenging conversations with uh, the family members at home, the spouses at home, or the uh, adult children who are the POAs and telling them your father or your wife uh, seems to be expressing interest in having intimate contact with another uh, elder living here. And we wanna talk to you about that. Again, that family member, especially if it's an adult child, none of us wanna think of our parents as being sexually active or having sexual uh, desires. And if it's a spouse, of course, it's very emotionally laden because this is a person that they're married to and is now perhaps showing interest in another adult. So these are very difficult um, conversations to have. Of course, the family involvement is always important. We want to listen uh, to the family, but I think we can sometimes set the tone for the conversation if we approach it with dignity, if we approach it uh, that this elder has the right uh, to have sexual desires and sexual expressions. Um, so we can sometimes set the tone. And then I think often, in, in, at least in my experience, these conversations with the family members, a lot of it is listening to them. And sometimes families who initially start out going, no way would my mom be doing this. Somebody must be making her do this. Or no way would I want my husband to be touching or intimate with some with another woman. Uh, and often these conversations are just best by giving the family member plenty of time to express their confusion, their beliefs, their, um, their hesitancies and their concerns. And without having to confront them to make a decision whether they would support this or not, just saying, well, okay, well, we wanted to let you know um, at this point we are uh, making efforts to interest your family member in other activities, to keep them engaged, to give them other meaning, uh, but we might need to revisit this again. Uh, can we set up a time next week to talk about it again? So we're not asking for them to give permission or to understand it the first time it's brought up. We also have to think about regulatory agencies and uh, licensing agencies. What what do what are their beliefs? What are their policies about sexual expressions for uh, residents and people living with dementia? And I have to say, it varies. Um, there are there is, are several cases in the media now that you can research. Uh, and the outcome on these cases is all over the board. So this is a, a case uh, where CMS uh, gave someone immediate jeopardy for allowing impaired residents to have sexual activity and the court upheld that. Uh, this was in a nursing home in Illinois and uh, it was just a couple of years ago, 2018. So this would be our, our, our personal nightmare, wouldn't it? I mean, to have a greenhouse home or to be in the news like this. Um, so I think it goes back to one really good documentation of the actions of the elder also the actions that we have taken to engage that elder in other types of meaningful um, engagements. We have to document our conversations with the family members. 
we also have to be very careful that we don't have two people with very dis with very discrepancy on their cognitive abilities you might have two people both affected by dementia but we know that the abilities can vary a lot from person to person and we absolutely want to protect one person from uh, being manipulated or having any engaging, being forced to engage in any activity that they would not give consent to. And, and so it's many layers. It's like peeling an onion here of the complexity of these cases. So this was um, some of the comments from the survey agency on the situation in that nursing home. And uh, sexual encounters between residents with dementia at a nursing home facility may not have been truly consensual. And the government was within their rights to fine the facility. Um, and so they, this particular case was in Illinois, not in, and, um, so this nursing home had a policy of intervening only when outward signs of non-consent were displayed. And they said this was not adequate to protect the residents. So again, I think with the first inclination that two residents are wanting to spend time together, that there's good documentation of what does that mean does that mean sitting on the couch and holding hands or does it mean that they are um, guiding one is guiding the other one into a private bedroom um, have they been found disrobed so the best documentation is from the first time that we are seeing that people have that desire to spend time together. And often it never goes beyond holding hands and sitting together on the couch, but that's still documented. And it's documented that uh, they both seem to be in agreement and receiving, it seems to be pleasurable and pleasant for both of them. They both are seeking each other out. Uh, family members have been informed. So all of that along the way, so that leaves a trail that it didn't just come to light once the couple is disrobed and in bed together, that there's been this trail all along of the progress of this relationship. So again, it's part of it, I think, is getting our staff trained and comfortable with talking about the possibility of sexual encounters and um, the importance of dialoguing about them early on. And again, that good communication uh, with family members. And it's unusual for family members not to agree for people to sit on the couch together. So if that's the first conversation we have with them and then they can see that their loved one might feel comfortable or safe or um, soothed by sitting together and spending time with another elder then in a couple weeks when we say well uh, now it looks like they are wanting to spend time alone in a private bedroom uh, we want to talk with you about this so there's everyone is getting the information and able to process it and dialogue it over the process i think we talked about that so um and, and remember, I had a, uh, a neighbor whose husband lived in a nursing home and she went to visit him every day. She was very connected to him. But after he was there to, for two or three months, um, 
and the staff had called her to warn her that when she walked in, she might find him sitting on the couch with this, uh, with another female resident and that they had been seen holding hands and walking around the community together. And so they gave her that advance warning. And when she went in there to visit her husband, he seemed uh, pleased to see her, but he did not move away or stop holding hands with this other female resident. And so my neighbor, she just began to sit and observe, tried not to be emotional about it. And I thought after she visited him a few times and continued to see this closeness that he had developed with this other woman, she said, you know, I'm taking it as a compliment that he misses the relationship and the closeness he had in our relationship and that now he's transferred this to somebody else. So I thought that was a very interesting way to look at it. it I thought it was a very um, mature uh, way to look at it. Uh, she said, I still love him as my husband. He still seems pleased to see me, but this is the person that he now sits next to on the couch and holds hands with. So it was an interesting family. Um, so if you've gone through these steps, and um, one of the places I worked in that um, specialized in dementia care, and we often had residents who did express interest in sexual activity. So many of the things we did, I've already talked about. Um, we would document at every level when we begin to see residents seek each other out. Uh, we would document that whether both parties were of similar cognitive level. And we often would get the healthcare provider, the physician or nurse practitioner involved in that and say, um, your patient Mary uh, seems to be very interested in spending time with this resident, Bob. Um, we want to be sure that you're aware of this. She seems to express pleasure and seek him out, but we want to make sure that you feel she is cognitively capable of expressing displeasure or her preference of not spending time with him. And so that was another level of documentation we would do. We would also document uh, how we did try to engage each of the residents in meaningful activities that we would personally um, get them involved with. So it could have been walks outside. It could have been um, special music or craft things that we thought they would have preferences for. We might try to engage them in a group activity together, or we might try and separate them and take Bob out to work in the men's group for a while with tools and take uh, Mary out to uh, work with uh, planning the menu for dinner. You know, so we tried and we would, doc we would document this and then we would also observe, okay, often they were willing to separate and go and be engaged in separate things, but at the end they would look for each other and continue to come back to each other. So we would document that. We also dialogued with the ombudsman. Um, and remember they're supposed to be advocates also. Uh, so we, we would tell them, we, we have spoken with the family, we have spoken with the physicians, we have made these efforts to engage these residents in other meaningful activities. And now we wanna let you know that they continue to seek each other out and we just want to, uh, you to be aware of that. So let's go into some um, case examples here. So um, Paula and David um, were looking forward to living together and uh, enjoying their retirement. But when Paula was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and went to live in a care home, uh, David continued to visit her, but then he began to feel that this was not the wife. He, he felt, began to feel like he had lost his wife, the woman that he knew and that he loved. Um, so 
Paula was obviously still interested in physical contact with him. Um, she would seek out uh, physical contact with him, and then she also would approach other men who were near her. Uh, she literally, I am, this is an accurate description. I saw her, she would stand outside her door and literally try and interest any male walking by, whether it was another elder or whether it was a staff member or the uh, plant maintenance man to come into her room with her. She was really interested in spending one-on-one -on -one time uh, with men. So we got together and we said, what can we do um, about this? And we said, well, what, what is it that she's seeking? Is, is she seeking sexual intercourse or is she just seeking physical contact? Uh, is she seeking one-on-one -on -one attention? So uh, we set up a, a program uh, where we were, uh, she started getting regular massages, hand and foot massages. Um, she also uh, was involved in other activities that were meaningful for her. We knew that she had some abilities and was interested in uh, clay modeling and sculpture. Uh, she had a history of working in the fashion industry, so we got her involved in that, and we really were able to keep her busy. And actually, her um, approaches to males in a sexual way did begin to decrease, and she seemed to just, the extra personal attention and the physical touch of the massages seemed to um, satisfy her. And so her actions, sexual, overt sexual actions began to decrease. Um, unfortunately for her husband, it was, it was really sad because he really did love her, but he was not interested in having a physical relationship with her at that point. And I think like a lot of family members, he was really grieving and began to go into some counseling for that. But this is a case where she almost could have been considered to have predatory behavior because she was trying to pull any man she could in to spend some time with her in her room. So another case example of Mary, um, and uh, Mary's been married for uh, 50 years and uh, moves into your memory care community and she becomes focused on a female uh, resident and begins to touch the female resident, um, hugs her, touches uh, the woman's breasts. The other woman doesn't uh, resist, seems to enjoy spending time. And Mary um, has started uh, going in and trying to spend the night in the same bed as Sarah. So again, it's um, what are our thoughts when you have a case like this? Because I can tell you in this instance, the family was horrified. Uh, they said, my mother has never expressed any preference for women. This is unlike her. Uh, we cannot support this. We will not allow it. And um, they absolutely told us that we could not permit this. So again, no easy answer here, but what is our role as care professionals to both Mary and Sarah? If both of them were showing that they were enjoying their time together, if both of them seemed to be seeking each other out, uh, if they were both of similar cognitive levels and it wasn't one person being predatory over the other, what were the rights of these two women? It's, um, it's, very, it's very complex. I think we're looking for a balance in every situation, wanting to protect the rights of the elders, but also protect their safety. Um, I can tell you the outcome in this case, and it's not one that I'm necessarily 
feel good about, but because the families of these two women were adamant that this would not be allowed, uh, that one of them actually moved out uh, to live in another location because it was a, a rather small memory care area and it was, <clears throat> pardon me, it was not possible to really uh, keep them separate. So I, but when I think back on the rights and whether it was, um, whether we treated them as adults and with dignity, um, it's a it's a challenge, and it's I'm not I don't necessarily feel good about the outcome of of this particular case. Okay, and then here's um, a case. I imagine that some of you on the call have had similar things. Uh, this is a retired minister. Uh, he was a prominent person in the community, and um, he was diagnosed with FTD. And sometimes the actions of people with FTD can be very, very challenging. They do not have a filter to um, prevent them from certain actions or language or things like that. So here's a man who was very respected, a member, uh, important member of the local community, uh, had a family and uh, began to use language uh, that I'm pretty sure everyone would consider offensive, and he would uh, describe women's bodies and was um, also wanting to act on that uh, to pull women into his uh, room. So FTD diagnosis has its own set of challenges with it. Um, these people who are diagnosed with FTD are often somewhat younger. They might be in their 60s. They might still be physically active and verbal, and they can appear very capable, yet they can't control their impulses, they lose their inhibitory mechanism, and they may do things that are socially uh, not acceptable. So again, so important to involve the family. Uh, of course, they were horrified. Their their loved one, who was a uh, retired minister, was now uh, had actions that were um, just really horrifying to them. They were so distressed. We tried unsuccessfully to um, distract or redirect Herb and get him involved in other things, and we were not successful with that. And so he moved and was relocated to a male only care home. So that was the outcome of that one. We tried very hard, hoping that this phase of his FTD illness would pass, uh, that he would get beyond this point, uh, that we could maybe physically tire him out. We tried taking him for long walks every day, uh, keeping him physically active, but it, began to be so disturbing to other uh, residents and family members that he had to relocate to a male only home. Okay, and one more um, case example. Uh, and this is, um, these two elders are living in your, your greenhouse home and uh, Martha has been seeking out Bob to sit on the couch and hold hands. She identifies him as her husband, even though she is married. And it's progressed to uh, now they are uh, being found in bed, uh, partially nude. So how would you handle that? What are your thoughts um, and what are your actions? Well, I wished we were in an instance where we were all sitting across from each other in the same room and we could talk about this. Um, again, there's no easy answer, but what I, the steps I would take would be the kinds of things we've been discussing, uh, where you start documenting, of course, good communication with the family members and the uh, letting the physicians know. And I think physicians often, Again, we set the tone with the physician. Often you call a physician about uh, their patient, Martha or Bob or whoever is 
starting to have sexual expressions with another person. And often the physician, their only toolbox is medications. So they're gonna say, well, do you want me to prescribe Haldol? Do you want me to prescribe Seroquel? Or do you want me to prescribe a sedative to, to uh, sedate them? That's probably gonna be their reaction is, what are you asking me for? Are you asking me for a prescription to sedate these people where they are unable to enact on their preferences? And so I think we have to be careful when we reach out to the healthcare team to first be creative and work as a team to say, how can we meet the needs of these elders? We're not necessarily asking that they need to be sedated so they can't enact um, on their, their desires. Um, so, so in this particular case, I used I use the case of two elders in a greenhouse home, but this was a case again that I was involved in. We did get the family members on both of these elders to agree that they were comfortable with them spending time privately in the bedroom. And if they um, disrobed, the family members were okay. And if they had, uh, sexual contact, the family members were okay, as long as they both, and this is a situation that you would continue to monitor. You would wanna be sure that what started out as a mutual consensual activity, that one elder does not begin to decline more rapidly than the other, or one elder is not expressing interest in it any longer. Uh, so it's, uh, if you do get permission to let this um, take place, you just do want to continue, obviously, to monitor it. All right. Um, so I hope we have time for some questions that people have put questions up. Um, and they would be fun if we had time to uh, discuss them a little bit. And thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This is an incredible session. And I want to invite all of our folks, if you've got questions, to put them in the uh, question box. Um, here's one. This is great information. Um, let's see what else we can get. I'm having a little bit of a hard time. Um, how can we obtain a copy of the Hebrew Home Policy? Hmm. Um, it is available um, online if you, um, I guess I don't have my references here, but I can, I can send that reference to uh, Susan at the Greenhouse Home and she can get it out to you. It is available. You can also Google it and it will come up, but, but I will send the reference to Susan Ryan and she can get it out to you if you, if you give Absolutely. her Mm-hmm. If you give her your... So send, send us your email if you um, are interested in getting that. Here's one. How would you handle a female resident who develops feelings for a female staff member? Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't, um, in some ways, I might consider that a little easier to manage because the staff member perhaps can understand all the ramifications and why things might be happening. That being said, uh, of course, the staff member has the right to be, not to be sexually harassed, not to be physically harassed. Um, so if it's just an interest where she has become really focused on a specific um, staff member, um, I think you would try and mitigate that by trying to have groups of people or more than one person with the elder at the same time uh, as that specific staff member. Um, again, I think I would go through some of the same steps we talked about, um, is that can you get that elder uh, 
interested in other actions and activities that don't involve this specific staff member. I also want us to remember the importance of physical activity and sunshine. Um, and not to oversimplify, but you can think about, I have a couple of teenage grandsons right now, and uh, I think it's very important. <laughs> My daughter talks about the importance of keeping them physically active. So it both um, wears them out physically, and then we also know there are studies of the value of natural sunlight on people living with dementia to help them calm them, help them sleep better and cope better and less actions like sundowning and things like that. So when you, when you look at your resources and things that we can do as professionals, be sure it also involves as much as possible, giving them regular outlets for physical activity and getting out and uh, getting sunlight when the weather permits. Here's another question. Um, any tips for navigating issues when there is a newly formed couple within long-term care, similar to the Bob and Martha scenario? However, one partner is still married to someone living outside the home. Has this happened and has have had this happen? It was very difficult um, to kind of navigate when the other person came to visit and saw the relationship occurring. Right, and it is. It's so difficult. I mean, I I can't imagine walking into some place and seeing my husband, you know, holding someone else's hand and wanting to go off into a bedroom with him. You know, I mean, it would it would bring up so much emotion. Um, I think similar to the to the case where I talked about my neighbor encountered her husband, but she had received a phone call that had helped warn her before she arrived, uh, we want you to know that your husband uh, seems to be interested in sitting next to this other female rest resident. They seem to be seeking each other out. Um, right now, they're just sitting on the couch and holding hands sometimes, but we wanted to let you know before you walked in to see it. Um, and then um, I think having a staff member to sit with that or to discuss with that fan, that wife or husband who lives outside, uh, this has to be really challenging for you. It has to bring up a lot of emotions, uh, giving them a chance to talk about it and acknowledge it. Um, I think perhaps talking about he must miss or remember the closeness that the two of you had. So while he doesn't necessarily think this person is his wife, um, he must miss that closeness. Um, right now it's bringing both of them comfort. We're trying to maintain dignity. Um, are you okay if we allow this? Although we are going to continue these other steps also, like we know your husband is, is interested in cars so we are going to get him involved in a, a car show that's coming up or so you're going to talk about the other things you're going to be doing but giving that person uh, that's well spouse a chance to talk about it there's a lot for them to process and um, a lot of sadness and more grief but um often i've seen it have really beautiful outcomes where the well spouse uh, will acknowledge that this is important and because they love their their husband or wife um, they they see that it brings them comfort and they will allow it or support it I'm going to just do one last uh, question consensual sex has its hazards slips falls misses they might fall off the bed so should it be approached like a referee in a boxing ring or a babysitter deciding what is appropriate mm. Um, good question. Um, I actually can't say I've ever seen those types of risks occur because 
often they are mo moving slowly and gingerly <laughs> and there isn't a lot of um, real uh, physical actions and moving around uh, not to say it couldn't happen uh, the most of the situations i have seen they are just found in bed and if if you've done your documentation the families are aware uh, we would uh, try and uh, one let staff know please don't go in there for um, 30 minutes or whatever time you're comfortable with uh, we're going to try and maintain their dignity and privacy um, i think if if people, if you felt that there was dangers of people falling out of bed, um, something like that, I don't know. That'd be really creative. Put the mattress on the floor. I don't know. I mean, it's it's like there's all these steps you go through, and then um, most often the trauma is you want to be sure that the woman is not being traumatized by sexual intercourse as an older woman who might not have adequate lubricant and all of that that's the most common trauma that i've seen um, and so again we have to be creative with things like that but i'm i'm not aware of people falling and hurting themselves not to say it no, couldn't yeah, it, it's interesting. I just had um, one of our teammates, Carol, who's also a nurse. She uh, sent me a text in kind of response to this. She said she once had an occupational therapist do an evaluation to help elders with positioning for sexual experiences. Of course, the elders had their clothes on while she worked with them, and they ended up providing a larger bed. So um, I think to your point, Anne, it's, you know, getting creative and recognizing you know the dignity that we want to afford and the privacy and everything else to something that is such an important part of who we are as humans so I wish you know there are more questions I wish we uh, in fact we'll have to have you back and maybe it'll be more for a Q&A where we can just really spend some time doing some of those case scenarios and we could invite those that were on the call today to send us some of those tough situations that you know we could do more of a, a q a but thank you Anne, so much for your time and i know that uh, your time is very valuable as you are providing some coaching to communities all across the country as they're dealing with uh, COVID 19 in their long-term care communities so thank you very much for your time and for everyone else on the call i want to just take a real quick moment to remind you of other webinars that are coming up we have one, uh, Mindy Cheek will be doing one on workforce and really creating uh, that workforce culture, uh, considering LGBTQ preferences for your staff. And that will be April 29 at uh, 3 p.m. And I am, uh, for deference of time and because my slides have frozen on my screen, um, here we go, here's another one, April 7, diversity and inclusion in senior living. Um, Jennifer Moranya, she is a, a great person, has a degree in, in this thing. She will be uh, talking to with us on April 7 at 3 o'clock. And Anne will be back um, talking about Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing. And really excited for us to have um, even some dialogue. So maybe you can send us some of your questions ahead of time so we can really think about um, the value of pets, the value of intergenerational opportunities. And Anne will be doing that April 9, 3 o'clock Eastern. Um, go to our website. You'll find out more information about our webinar series. We are, again, very thankful for who you are. For those of you that uh, wanted to get nursing contact hours, you can send an email to Mary Hoffner Thomas um, at the Greenhouse Project, and you'll see her email address there. She needs your name, address, and the completed nursing evaluation tool, which you will find in the handout section of today's webinar. Um, if you're going for NAB, administrator credits, contact hours, uh, send again the email to Mary. Uh, there's her email address. And she'll need your last name, first name, as it is on your NAB data, on the NAB database, your title, license number, licensing state, address, 
contact information, the R number, and the completed NAP evaluation form. Thank you again, everyone, for the work that you are doing every day. Um, this, the PowerPoint can be downloaded as a PDF. It's in the handout section. Once again, we are grateful for the work that you do every day, and again, grateful for your time and your attention to today's webinar. Have a great week, be well, be safe, and we hope to see you again soon.